Good morning, church, in person, online. Good morning. Yes, it's, it's the season finale of uh, season 13. It's been an 80s edition. See, the music wasn't all bad in the 80s. You have been misled. Yeah, we started off, well, well you know how I am. We started off, we cheated. I cheated. You didn't cheat. I cheated. We started off with uh, August 1979. Not exactly the 80s, but close. Uh, Bob Dylan got to serve somebody. And we got into the 80s. A second track uh, from 1985. Everybody wants to rule the world, tears for fears. Then we went to 86 with Steve Winwood, Higher Love. And then last Sunday, a song that's near and dear to my heart from 1987, Joshua Tree album by U2. I still haven't found what I'm looking for. All right, and so we got one more, and we're going to take it all the way to the end of the decade. This comes, th- this album that the song comes from was released April 24th, 1989. I remember when that album came out. Well, the artist, the artist is Tom Petty. I want some love for Tom Petty. I do. Now, yeah, this is, this is the fourth time. This is now the 79th song in this long-running series and this is the fourth time I've drawn upon dear Tom Petty and yes admittedly finding God in the music does not cover the entire breadth of popular music it's music that BZ likes all right so that's that's just the way that deal is going to be uh I do love Tom Petty uh and the album came out in 1980s full moon fever so I've got, I've got the vinyl here. Trust me, I did not have the vinyl in 1989 because I didn't have a record player anymore in 1989 because we knew that was over. And I had the CD. But then, uh, then vinyl made a comeback because we were, we're streaming everything and, and we want to like, I want to I hold something. I want to put it on a turntable. So I, I've got the vinyl. You know, there's some of these people I just can't give enough of my money away to. <laughs> And so you just keep buying it in different formats. That's the way it goes. Um, yeah, Tom Petty, you know, he passed away. I remember it, October 2nd, 2017. I shed a tear that day. That was, that was very sad. He was 66. He's just one of the greatest rock and roll songwriters of all time. He just never has written a bad song. He was just incapable of writing a bad song. There's some people like that. Um, well, this album... Full Moon Fever. Uh, in 2019, 20 years after it was released, it was inducted into the Grammy Hall of Fame and recognized for just having lasting artistic significance. Uh, Full Moon Fever was Tom's, Tom Petty's first album without the Heartbreakers. Uh, not, yes, he had Mike Campbell with him, his guitar player, because he never went anywhere without him. Mike Campbell, but uh, the rest of the players are uh, Jeff Lynn. He also produced the album. That's the ELO guy. Anybody like ELO? I like ELO, yeah. Uh, Jeff Lynn. And then, then he had a couple of his bandmates from the Wilburys. Uh, they used to be in another band you may have heard called the Beatles. And uh, so George Harrison and Ringo Starr are on this album. You'll see Ringo Starr in the video. Oh, they're all in the video, uh, but Ringo's being his lovable, winsome whimsical self you know you can't help but love Ringo Starr and you'll see that so what well this is the album that starts off with Free Fallen anybody like Free Fallen what a great song and and the end of side one is running down a dream I could have used that one but I'm going with the second track I won't back down yeah a song that just embodies rock and roll defiance I won't back down um it's a song that is mostly a chorus. I mean, there are technically these verses, but the verses and the chorus, are all, it's, it's just kind of this one chorus over and over embodying rock and roll defiance. I, the, the, I'm not going to show you the words when we play the video, but, but uh, the words are, yeah, well, I won't back down, I won't back down. You can stand me up at the gates of hell, but I won't back down. No, I'll stand my ground, won't be turned around, and I'll keep this world from dragging me down. I'm going to stand my ground. Well, I know what's right. I got just one life in a world that keeps on pushing me around. Well, I'll stand my ground. And then it goes into the real chorus, although the whole thing sounds like a chorus. Uh, Hey, baby, there ain't no easy way. I'm going to say that to Perry. Hey, baby, 
There ain't no easy way out. <laughs> so what do we do? Well, we, 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 we stand our ground. And we won't back down. So we're going to play that. And you know, you know, onliners, you know how the copyright deal works. Can't stream it to you directly from here. So you go get it. You can go to wlc.com slash music videos or just go to YouTube. It's there. It's the official Tom Petty version of I Won't Back Down the video. We're going to play it. Play it loud. I don't know who's got their hand. Is it Aaron? Whoever's got their hand on the, on the knob back there on the lever. Just push it up. And so if it's too loud, if it's too loud, you all come talk to me, not them, because I, I want this song loud. Um, and I'm just going to invite you to sing along with the chorus, all right? Can we just, can we just sing along? With, so, so join Jeff Lynn and George Harrison and Ringo Starr and Tom Petty with I Won't Back Down. Yeah, you can stand me up at the gates of hell, but I won't back down. Yeah, hallelujah. The gates of hell. You stand me up at the gates of hell. The gates of hell enter into the Western vocabulary and imagination from the Bible. Now, I mean, actually, it's, it's in most cultures, there's this idea of of the, the powers of the underworld that might be threatening to us. But the actual phrase, gates of hell, comes from the Bible. It first appears in the book of Isaiah when King Hezekiah describes his impending death as being consigned to the gates of hell. Now, that's King James translation, gates of hell. It's really gates of Sheol, Hebrew, or gates of Hades, Greek. It's the gates of death. It's the realm of death or also the power of death. But the gates of hell has really become famous to us because of something Jesus said. Very, very famous verse of Scripture, Matthew 16, 18. Upon this rock I will build my church. And what? The gates of hell shall not prevail. Jesus was uh, with his disciples way up in northern Galilee, up in what we call today the Golan Heights. It borders modern-day Syria. It's right up there on the border between Israel and Syria, the Golan Heights, upper Galilee. And up there, there was this Roman city, Caesarea Philippi. It was an ancient city, but it had been renamed after Caesar and after one of Herod's sons, Philip. And Jesus was in the region. He didn't enter the city. Jesus never entered um, Gentile cities, and he didn't allow his disciples to do so. But he's in the region of Caesarea Philippi. And there outside the city is a cave. I've seen this cave a few times. A cave that people had dubbed the gates of hell. Probably lots of caves like that around the world, but this one outside of Caesarea Philippi was called the gates of hell. And inside the cave, right in the entrance, there was a shrine to the Greek god Pan, from which, by the way, we get our word panic. Yeah, that's where that comes from. And Jesus is in that area, by the gates of hell, by the shrine to the god of panic. And he says, well, who do people say that I am? And they say, well, some say you're John the Baptist raised from the dead. Some say you're Elijah, some say you're Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But who do you say that I am? And it's Peter that spoke up. And this is why he becomes, you know, the preeminent among the apostles, because he was the first to get it and first to speak it. He said, you are the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus was impressed. He said, whoa. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. You didn't figure that out on your own. If you know who I am, it's because my Father has revealed it to you. And I'm going to change your name. Simon Bar-Jonah. Simon, Simon Jonason. I'm going to change your name, Simon Jonason, to Petros. 
Rocky. It means Rocky. I'm going to change your name from Simon Jonason to Rocky. And upon this rock, I'll build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. This is the first time Jesus introduces the concept of the church, this ecclesia, this gathering of people called out of their private lives into a public gathering around him. And Jesus introduces the concept of the church in the context that somehow it is a bulwark against the powers of cosmic evil let loose in the world. That the church will come into existence through our shared confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and we gather together around that. And gathering around that, there is created this entity against which the gates of hell cannot and shall not ultimately prevail. So the church, as the baptized gathering of Jesus' followers, is to be a stronghold against the gates of hell, cosmic evil in the world, just, just the presence of evil that's hard to define and understand exactly where it comes from, but we know that it's there. The church is to be a stronghold against that. Now, the church, this is very important, the church is not, the church is not, the church is not called to fight evil. That's a very common concept. That's, my goodness, that lurks behind every single war that has ever happened. There's evil out there. Let's go fight it. The church is not called to fight evil. No. The church is not called to fight evil, but it is called to stand against evil, to not be shaped and formed by it, and thus to become a kind of citadel of light in this present darkness. Let me read from uh, the book of Ephesians. This is, this is the Apostle Paul one of his, one of his uh, loftiest epistles. The letter he wrote to the church in Ephesus. He's coming to a conclusion, and he says this toward the end. He says, finally, be strong in the Lord, in the strength of his power. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand. I'm going to stand my ground, and I won't back down so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle, there is a struggle. There ain't no easy, easy way out, baby. <laughs> For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Therefore... Take up the whole armor of God so that you may be able to withstand on the evil day. And having done everything, to stand your ground and not back down. So church, we're not called to fight evil, but it's just simply to stand against it. That is to be something other. I mean, if we think, okay, we're in the world, and there's, how many of you know there is evil in the world? Yeah, everybody knows that. And what we tend to think is, uh, it's out there somewhere, it's them. Identify the bad guys, go fight them, and then, we'll, then the world will be good. <laughs> if that was going to happen, the world would have become good a long time ago. We're not called to go fight evil. We're called to not be shaped by, but just to stand and say, I'm not going to go along with that. I'm, I'm not going to be that. You can stand me up at the gates of hell, but I won't back down. I'm going to stand with Jesus. I'm going to be informed by Christ. I'm not going to threaten you. I'm not going to fight you. I'm not going to hurt you. I'm not going to harm you, but I won't back down either. And if the evil becomes so severe that it says, well, we will kill you then, we say, all right, I get to be a martyr. So you don't hear talk like that anymore. For the first 300 years, the church really gloried in their martyrs. Even to the extent that preachers had to get up on Sunday and preach to the congregation and say, now don't go out and just try to get yourself martyred. 
you know, don't do that. But the idea that they would have to fight to defend their faith, you know, there's that, there's that thinking. You know, we may have to take, all, take up arms to defend the Christian faith. The early church would have said, what is wrong with you? Of course you don't. You become a martyr. The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And so we resist even unto the shedding of, you know, we love not our lives even unto death. We overcome the evil in the world by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimonies, and we choose not to love our lives even if it, even if it means that we lay down our life, even unto death. It's in Revelation chapter 12. So we're not called to fight evil, but simply to stand against it and to be something other. If we try to fight evil, the, the temptation inevitably becomes too great to employ the means of evil against evil, and then, and then we become evil. Then the evil just migrates and just infects us. And when we try to fight evil, the temptation to use the means of evil against evil becomes too great, and then we become the evil that we fight. That's, that's probably, that's at least one of the oldest tricks in the devil's playbook, and he keeps using it because it keeps working. <clears throat> this is why the worst thing that can happen to the church is that the church allow itself to be seduced into providing religious sanction for the kingdoms of this world. So the kingdoms of this world, they all carry around with them this, this idea, this ethos that, that we are the champions of good and light in the world. And so occasionally we have to go kill the bad guys so that there can continue to be goodness in the world and not evil because that's who we are. And then the church gets tempted to come along and say, yes, God is on your side. Go kill the bad guys. And we will, we will pray over you and we'll bless you and we'll, we'll anoint your tanks with, with holy water. I saw Orthodox priests doing that in Russia. Oh, made me sick. That's the worst thing the church can do. <clears throat> because the church serves one king and one king only. We serve King Jesus. Now, we're, we're, we're capable and we are good citizens. We'll pay our taxes. We'll be honest. We'll treat one another neighborly. We're called to that in Christ. But we will not pledge our allegiance to the worldly empire's ambition to eradicate e evil by killing other people. And we say, no, that's not, that's not what we're called to. And so we become something other. Evil is a complex phenomenon. I don't want this whole sermon to be on it because that's, that's a, those are deep waters. Evil is a complex phenomenon. It seems to be only present among humans, I would say ultimately. You know, is there natural evil? I don't know. There's disease. That's evil. That's a phenomenon. Can animals be evil? I don't think so. Maybe the, maybe the higher species can act against something they would know would be moral. I don't know. That's a great question. But evil is a complex phenomenon, and it belongs more to sinful structures than sinful nature. If we're going to talk about sinful nature, I say it's more, it has more to do with being formed in idolatry and injustice because we are born into a world that has already been formed in idolatry and injustice. We see this in the demonic phenomenon of the mob. I mean, when, when, I, look at, when I look at a little child that's you know, just born, and I go, oh, look at that cute little sinner. Born a sinner. I don't think that way. I understand they are born into a sinful world, and of themselves they will not be capable of resisting, and they also will participate in sin in various levels. But sin is more structural than it is part of the human nature. I'm not saying it's not part of the human nature. I'm just saying that's not where the big problem lies. That's evidenced in the phenomenon of people will do in a mob what they would never do as an individual. People will do as a mob, either a literal mob or an internet mob. They will do as a mob what they would never do as an individual. The person who would stop and help you change your tire by the side of the road 
may very well also stone you once they join the mob. <clears throat> this is the demonic phenomenon of the mob. And this is what Jesus had to confront when they brought him the woman caught in adultery. And there's this mob and they've got their stones and they said this woman was caught in adultery. And the Bible says to stone such women, what do you say? They've, al they've already transformed into a demonic mob. They are not a gathering of individuals. They have, they have become one entity. They are a demonic mob. They have become the Satan. And most people in that group, if not all of them, would not personally execute this woman. But as a mob, they'll do it. And that's why they do it by stoning. Because stoning allows you to participate in killing someone and tell yourself, I didn't do it, I just threw one stone. And so there, this is a critical moment. This is a dangerous moment. There's a lot going on here. The mob says this woman is an adulteress, and the Bible says, stone her, what do you say? And Jesus doesn't say anything. He first ignores them. He's de-escalating the situation here. If Jesus had simply said, all right, you're going to have to come through me before you get to her. I'm ready to fight you. They'd have killed Jesus and her both. Jesus doesn't do that. First, he ignores them. He doesn't say anything. They persist. Then he writes something on the ground. I don't know what he wrote. Quit asking me that. I don't know. I wish I did. Maybe he wrote, and I won't back down. I don't know what he wrote. He wrote something. But that didn't, they kept, and then, then Jesus acts in divine genius. And he doesn't say, you can't stone her. What he says is, all right, let the one among you all who is without sin cast the first stone. What Jesus is doing is breaking the demonic spell of the mob. All right, you want to stone her? Fine, but you're going to have to do it as an individual and reflectively. Ask yourself first, am I without sin? Can I stand in judge of this one? Am I, a, am I better than her? Am I without sin? And if you can say yes to that, then you take the initiative, be responsible for your actions, and you say, everybody stand back, I'm going to throw the first stone. And no one wants to do that. And, and beginning with the oldest, down to the youngest, they all depart. Jesus said, uh, where are your accusers? Did no one condemn you? She said, no one, sir. And she said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. One of the most beautiful stories in the Bible. The power structures of this world are under the sway of, of the cosmic powers of darkness. That's what it says in 1 John 5, 19. The whole world, that is the world system. Not God's good creation, but the world system. The world as it's arranged. The whole world, the whole system lies under the sway of the wicked one. And power structures under the sway of the wicked one become the single greatest source of sin, sorrow, and human suffering in the world. If we place all of the focus, if we place all of the focus on personal sin, the principalities and powers, which are the primary source of structural sin and great human sorrow and suffering, are allowed to just to remain undetected, unexposed, and they operate without any prophetic challenge. For example, if I get up here on a Sunday morning and I preach a sermon, on the personal sin of greed. So you shouldn't be greedy. You should be generous. You shouldn't just form your life around being greedy. You should be generous. Everybody be like, yeah, right, I know that. It's cool. It's a good reminder. Thank you, Pastor. But if instead I say, how come we live in an arrangement of the world where we have the phenomenon of simultaneously having billionaires and a billion people living in abject poverty. And there's nothing wrong with that. People get nervous. 
When I say, you know, there are people that have a billion dollars and there's 1.3 billion people who live on less than $2 a day. That don't seem right. Somebody says, what are you, a Marxist? No, I'm a Christian. I read scripture. I see how the Hebrew prophets railed against that. I see what Jesus said. I see what Paul and James said about that. But then people get nervous. Because why? Because you've poked the cosmic evil. The principalities and powers. It's very, and we're under that sway and people get very nervous. See, I, I feel it right now. I feel the tension. I feel it right now. Oh, let the one without you don't let the one among you without sin cast the first stone at Pastor Beasy. All right, just... All right, I like Tom Petty, and I like his song because of its rock and roll defiance toward the world. Now, admittedly, too much of that can get you in trouble. <laughs> I'm well aware of this. But I, on, and I mean this sincere, this is not me just having fun preaching on Sunday morning. I, Having a bit of rock and roll defiance has actually served me well in life. It's kept me from just being swept along in silly religious trends and things like that. Where I just call into th things into question and I'm just not immediately going to follow the crowd. Um, a little bit of that kind of defiance is necessary in order, um, well, to be a Christian. <laughs> I mean, it's just part of... It's, it's just part of, of I mean, there is, a, there is a kind of holy rebellion to being a Christian. I know, I know that that sounds so strange 17 centuries into Christendom. And Christendom's, you know, collapsing, thank God. But, I mean, being, listen, being a Christian is not the same as just being a good citizen. Being a Christian says, I've pledged my allegiance to Jesus, and I'm going to follow him no matter what the wider society says. You can stand me up at the gates of hell, but I won't back down. I mean, that kind of defiance lurks in the biblical admonitions when Paul says things like, don't be conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Keep your mind on Jesus. Focus on him. Let him inform you. Don't just go along with the way of the world. Because as John says, another admonition, 1 John 2, 15 and following, love not the world, the world system, nor the things of the world. For all that's in the world, basically, it's the lust of the flesh, the lust of eyes, the pride of life. And these things are not from the Father, they're from the world, and the world is passing away, and it's lust thereof. So, to, to really be a committed Christian, you need a little bit of defiance. You need a little bit of attitude. Yeah, well, I won't back down. Amen, I like it. But it's not exactly what Paul is saying. And this is another one of those examples where... The loss of the second person pronoun plural <laughs> in English creates confusion. I'll explain. Let's look at this text one more time. Ephesians 6, verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord, in the strength of His power. Put on the whole armor of God so that you, ye, you all, it's plural. See, in English, in modern English, we can't tell whether the you is singular or plural. We have to guess. But in most languages, it's made clear. And in the language that Paul writes us in, it's made, he's not, we tend to read this as, uh, man, I got to go out there today, put a brave face on, put on the full armor of God, try to withstand. Who knows what the devil's up to? Well, there's some of that. But it's more, the Spirit is talking to Word of Life Church and saying, all right, be this alternative society, be this different kingdom. And together, you all, Together, you all stand against the wiles of the devil. For our, we're in, it, we're in this together, for our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you, ye, y'all, plural, may be able to withstand on that evil day and having done everything to stand firm. We, we don't stand against the gates of hell alone. We just don't. We have to do it together. Honestly, the lone individual has little chance 
of standing against the forces of cosmic evil. But the church, empowered by the Holy Spirit, can do it. So that's why, that's why it's important that you belong, that you draw together. Because what we can't do alone, we can do together. That's why Jesus said, upon this rock, I'll build my church. And the gates of hell won't prevail against the church. And besides that, you know, you, you can't be the alternative society of God all by yourself. That's what the kingdom of God is, the alternative society of God built around Jesus. You can't be that by yourself. This is just one reason why the church is essential and why Jesus gave us the church, because... We really have little chance of withstanding cosmic evil as a lone individual. We'll just be swept up in it. And, and of course, this is why it's so damaging and tragic when the church betrays its fidelity to Christ and begins to serve the kingdoms of this world. That's, I mean, that, here's what I mean. I mean, for example, in 1930s Germany, the vast majority of the German evangelical church supported the Nazis. And they said, God has raised up Hitler to make Germany great, and this is God's will. And so if, we, if we're going to be true to God, we have to serve this new party because God's using them, blah, 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 blah. And that didn't turn out well. And look, the vast majority of German evangelicals supported the Nazis. This may sound crazy to you, but I don't blame most of them. They couldn't withstand it. Who I do blame is the leadership, the pastors. A wizard should know better. A pastor should know better. A bishop should know better. I mean, that's why they're going to give a stricter account. That's why, the, you have, that's why you have shepherds to guard the sheep. And when the shepherds become wolves and lead the sheep to the slaughter, it's not the sheep that come in for great judgment, it's the shepherds. But why am I preaching that to you? I'll just have to have some pastors and preach that to them. All right. True holiness is an act of rebellion against the world as it is. True holiness is an act of rebellion against the world as it is. And in our secular and libertine age, religion may be the last act of rebellion. So I draw upon the practices of an ancient religion to resist being conformed to the world. So, I mean, I begin my days. I do this every day. I begin my day by entering into the ancient world of Scripture and praying ancient prayers and confessing an ancient creed and sitting daily with Jesus in contemplative prayer. Other people may look at that and say, how arcane. That's religious. I would, you know, they would see that as tame as uh, even conformist, I suppose. I tell you, it's probably my daily greatest act of rebellion. Is that I allow myself to be formed by a text that is thousands of years old. And I confess an ancient creed that's 2,000 years old. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And I pray a whole series of liturgy and I sit with Jesus in contemplation. What am I doing? I'm rebelling against the world as it is because I know me. I know if I don't do things like that, I am incapable as a lone individual of not being shaped in the ways of greed and pride and selfishness. Oh, I can be selfish. I would say ask Perry, but I don't want you to. If I'm, that's the, the way of the world is to be selfish, and I am inclined toward that. I need the practices of the Christian religion. I'm going to use that word religion. Religion. I need the rigors of religion to rebel against the secular age that says you don't need to pray. You don't need ancient prayers. You don't need to trust an ancient creed. Yes, I do. And it's my act of rebellion. Because if I don't engage in these ancient practices of the Christian religion, I'll end up conformed to the world under the sway of the wicked one. Sheer determination alone is not enough to stand against the gates of hell. We need spiritual formation. So, for example, we live right now in an age of tribalism and rage. What would be the rebellion of that? The fruit of the Spirit. The fruit, I mean, 
Think about our age, think about the age that we live in, think about the present moment in America and just kind of what's out there, the zeitgeist, the mood. And now listen to these words, love, joy, peace, patience. Oh, we live in such a patient age, don't we? Now, to be patient is an act of rebellion. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, kindness, whatever, but kindness. If you, just, if you just allow yourself to be swept along with the spirit of the age, you will be cruel. But if you can draw upon the spirit, if you can be in the presence of Jesus, if you can be filled with the Holy Spirit, you can be filled with love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control as an act of rebellion. And along with spiritual formation, we are also sustained by the sacrament of the Eucharist, by which we partake of the body and blood of Christ. We're strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Well, how am I going to get that? Well, part of that is I, I have a sacramental access. I feed upon the body and blood of Jesus that his life, his strength might be in me. I eat of this bread, I drink of this cup. No, I don't want to say it that way. We eat of this bread and we eat of this cup that we might stand in the evil day. That we can say, you put me up at the gates of hell, but I won't back down. Why? Because I got the power of the Lord. I got the strength of the Lord in me. I'm strong in the power of his body because his body and his blood nourish my body and my blood. Amen. Stand with me. We sang that song last Sunday. We're going to sing it again this Sunday. Jaira comes out of Genesis 22 where Abraham finds the ram in the thicket that he can offer to God on, in, in substitute for his, for his son Isaac on Mount Moriah. And Abraham gives that mountain a new name. He says, I'm going to call this place Jehovah Jaira, meaning the Lord will provide. See this table? This is where the Lord provides. You and I, we're not strong enough to stand against evil. We're not strong enough on our own. We're not. Let's be honest. Quit thinking you have, a, you know, get rid of your superhero, I got a cape on complex. We're not strong enough. But God provides. And he provides the body and blood of Jesus that we might be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. So we're coming to the table where the Lord provides. Let's first of all confess our Christian faith together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Now join with me in confessing our sins. Most merciful God, we confess that we've sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us. That we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your name, amen. And God is gracious to all who confess their sins and in humility ask for mercy. So in the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. 